Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to E-Tuesday. A little bit later than usual, but I'm here. And I'm so glad to see that you are joining me today. Um, I will greet you a little bit later, if that's okay. Because we have Maria Boven from Sweden here today. Good afternoon to you. Um, and nobody else is saying hello. So I can't greet anybody else until you say hello to me in the comments. But it's so good to have you here this afternoon. Lisa Spagnolo is here. Good afternoon to you. Um, this afternoon I said I'm speaking to you. If you saw my advert, Life in the Sun, not in the sunshine, um, in the sun, in Christ. Our lives in Christ are not meant to be lived in a downward slump or struggle after struggle. I'm just trying to keep my microphone on here, we are meant to live a different life to what we knew before, before we came into the kingdom. Ingrid Willers, good afternoon to you. Um, so I'm going to pray for you while we wait for some people to join in. I'll pray for you. So Lord, I thank you for every person joining today, every person who will hear this message, every person who has a heart that feels downcast. And also, every person who's excited to be in the kingdom and to hear what you're doing these days. And that you have a purpose for every single one of us. So, Lord, I, I thank you that today you're going to minister to our hearts. You're going to encourage us, build us up, and also adjust things in our thinking that might need to be adjusted. And so I thank you, Lord. I just speak your blessing over every single person joining now and people who will watch later as well that they'll receive from your hand today in Jesus name. So let's get into it. Um, while I was sitting here at my desk, I was checking up on my Instagram account. And there is somebody I follow on Instagram. His name is Charlie Mackesy. And maybe you've heard of him. He wrote the book. He's won an Oscar for this book. It's an anime, a cartoon. I don't like to call it a cartoon. Um, it's draw, hand drawn um, figures. And there are little sayings in there that are so meaningful and so deep. But they speak to children and adults as well because of the messages in there. I think I never get the name of the book correct. It's something like the boy, the fox, the mole, and the horse. Those are the characters. And it's probably a different, um, it's probably the fox, the boy, the mole, and the horse or something like that. But um, that's the idea. You, if you look up Charlie Mackesy, you will find the book and all his quotes. I'm telling you, it's so worthwhile to follow this guy. And so what I saw at the top of my newsfeed on Instagram was this, the, in, in handwriting, on his, on his page. It says here, I was chatting to a friend who teaches kids from quite tough backgrounds. And she said, can you make another book? The first one gave some of my boys permission to be kind and to be honest about how they feel. And he says, this welled me up. And I thought, it's so amazing how, talking about children now, but when we think about our own lives, this got me thinking because it, it sort of fits into what I'm going to speak about today. When we think about how these kids coming from, she says, or he or she said, quite tough backgrounds, and reading the book that this guy wrote, um, seeing the kindness and the honesty and things in this book, you have to look it up. You don't have to buy the book. You can follow him on Instagram and you see all his quotes there. And that's enough for me. I love the book. I'm sure I'll get it someday. Um, but just seeing how other people out there um, the characters in this book were kind and thoughtful. You know, I used to love Winnie the Pooh. I still do, I have to admit. My favorite character is Piglet in Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> I'm really confessing now. And, you know, the little things they say to each other to encourage each other and to remind each other that they love each other. And so these kids reading this book by Charlie Mackesy, when they saw... 
how other people were behaving, um, even if it was a mole or a fox or a horse or a little boy who's an animated character, it, they felt something in their lives that made them forget the background they came from. And as this person says, the first one gave my boys, some of my boys, permission to be kind and to be honest about how they feel. That's what the book is all about. And so you and I today, if we live with a constant, and this is not my message, I'm just saying this because this is what I thought when I saw this post. If we live with a constant mentality of our background, our background, your background might have been tough, like these boys in this, in this post I saw. Your background might have been really tough. Your life today might still be difficult. Your experience that you've had growing up or in your adult life, when we see somebody behaving differently, being honest, standing up for the truth, being kind to other people, it changes the way we think about ourselves. And then we want to be, it's almost like a door is open and we're giving access to, well, I can really be honest about how I feel. I can be kind to other people. I can be thoughtful. And so that just made me think that, that you and I in the kingdom have access to all of these things, kindness, grace, mercy, truth, honesty, um, you know, giving and receiving unconditional love. We, this is our atmosphere of, of our lives in Christ. And when we behave that way, then other people are given access to that as well. It's like, here's an example. I, I, I just think about this now. When you go to church and you are so excited about worshiping God, but maybe you go to a church where nobody raises their hands or they don't clap or they don't dance and it's just very reserved worship. You're going to go in there no matter how you feel inside. You're going to start to behave normally. This is what happens. You're going to start to behave the way that everybody else does. So you'll become a person who's very reserved in your worship. And then one day somebody comes to visit and they are, have got their hands up in the air and, you know, dancing in the front. And that gives you permission to do that as well because you've always longed to do that. Now that's, that's our life in Christ as a believer giving other people access to the grace and the kindness and the favor that we already have, that we're walking in. When someone is bold and you are timid and you hang out with a person who's bold about their faith, that's going to rub off on you a bit. So let's get into my message today. I see a few more people have joined in. Thank you so much for joining. I'm waiting for you to say hello in the comments. Just so that I can greet you. Ilza Gopal is watching. Good to have you back. And Renee Ibe is here. Renee Ibe is one of the regulars in my life. And it's so good to see you, Renee. Okay, so, Renee, I don't know if you've registered for the 6th of May. I hope you are going to be there. Okay, so life in the sun. As I said, not in the sunshine, in the sun, life in Christ, our lives in Christ. Firstly, do you know that the Bible, if you read the New Testament and some scriptures in the Old Testament, speaks about saints a lot, to the saints who are at Ephesus, to saint this, saint that. And I'm not talking about Saint Catherine or Saint someone in that we know, the traditional saints. I'm talking about the Bible, when the Bible mentions saints, and that means to be set apart. A saint is someone who's been set apart. So who do you think the saints are? The born-again believers, the members of the kingdom of God are the saints. So that's you and I. So your life already is a life that has been set apart in Christ. So if you turn with me to John 5, uh, 1 John 5, verse 11 and 12, this is what it says. 1 John 5, 11 and 12. It says this, um, and this is the testimony. It's Before that, it's talking about he who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. Um, and then it says in verse 11, and this is the testimony. And the word testimony there can also say evidence. This is the testimony or the evidence that God has given us eternal life. And this life 
is in his son. I just want to get my phone up here so I can see that everything is still behaving the way it's supposed to be. So this life is in his son. And verse 12 says, He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. Now, we know a lot of people out there in the world are not born again, but they do have the life that we know of. But what it's saying here is they don't have the God kind of life that you and I do as kingdom, members of the kingdom. People out there in the world have life, but they do not really know what life is. Now, it, the word eternal life, because it says here in verse 13, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, you and I, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Now, you and I called as saints. Remember, I told you that you're a saint. So from now on, you can call yourself Saint Ilza, Saint René, Saint Catherine. But you know, you don't really have to. Um, it's a position in Christ, being set apart. If you go and call yourself saint and you tell your pastor that I said you can, you'll get into trouble, and so will I. So you need to know that this life spoken about in 1 John 5 means Zoe life, the God kind of life. And it means a life that is active and vigorous, devoted to God. An eternal life is life without beginning and without end. God knew you before you were born, and you're going to live a life that has no end. Isn't that amazing? So in Christ, we come into this timeless, limitless place because God lives outside of time. I think you know that. And so when we come into the kingdom and we are set apart, we are given access to this God kind of life, a life that is active and vigorous, devoted to God. Your life is not meant to be lived in a downward slump, feeling stuck all the time, feeling as if you are going nowhere, hearing nothing, doing nothing. <laughs> Our lives are not meant to be lived like that. But without an understanding that in Christ we have a different life, we put up with the I feel stuck. I can't hear from God. We put up with all that stuff. And I'm going to explain some of that as we go on. I posted something yesterday, I think, or sometime on the weekend. You have been anointed and qualified, not because of anything you have done, but because of everything Jesus has done. Everything he did. So you can look. turn with me to Isaiah 53. Let's look at Isaiah 53. I'm giving you some really basic things to think about and to change your mindset about your life and the way it's being lived today. It's not meant to be a bed of roses. I'm not saying that at all. But being in the kingdom, we have access to so much that we do not even open the door to receive by faith because we think, this is normal. What's happening with me is just normal. And it's not because your life has been changed. Um, what did I say? Isaiah 53. Remember I said, You've been anointed and qualified not because of anything you have done, but because of everything Jesus has done. And I already read to you 1 John 5, 11 to 13, if you joined in late. And a few people did join in a little bit late. So Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5. This is what Jesus did. And because it's been the Easter weekend, you probably heard somebody preach about this on the weekend but this is a daily thing we need to be reminded of if we really want to be, live the God kind of life. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement or the punishment for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And then you can read the rest of Isaiah 53. Now to me, when I 
when I think about things things that, that bother me in my thinking, things that come my way to hinder me in my purpose in the kingdom, when I have a dream or a vision to do something with God and then reminders come up about who I once was, Isaiah 53 just lays, lays it all out for us that the price was paid for me to live a different life, a new life. I'm now a new creation because of what Jesus did. And I live this different life with a different way of thinking, a different expectation. And I heard Rory speaking this morning. I heard the beginning of his message about the good news. The gospel is good news. We are not here to be heard, to hear that we have to be heard, to hear that we've been taken out of darkness and brought into God's marvelous kingdom of light. That is great already. Then to hear that I have an inheritance that Jesus paid for, and all he says to me is, get a revelation of what, what I did for you, what belongs to you, and live a life that overcomes all that stuff that's trying to join you in your new life, the stuff that's come from your past and your mistakes and your bad choices and, and, and the curses of family line and all of that stuff. In Christ, we step over the line and we live a life, the God kind of life, a life that is active and vigorous and devoted to God with all the benefits that Jesus paid for. Isn't that amazing? I do not understand why people don't want to get to know God. Is it, you know, we, we know the devil has blinded the minds of people and they think it's religion. And they think you've got to give things up. But when we get saved and we come into the kingdom of God and we see the peace that we have and, and the, the rewards and hearing the voice of God and all of these things, it far outweighs the stupid things that we thought were important before we got saved. So, Life in Christ is what I'm speaking about if you've just joined in now. So, have a, have a look at Isaiah, um, Isaiah, Ephesians 1. Let's go, we have to go to Ephesians 1. And I'm going to give you some things to think about today so that you will not see yourself as this poor little wimp who has to be rescued every Sunday morning. Um, okay, so... You know, we only get rescued on Sunday mornings because that's when we go to church. The rest of the week should, is just an uphill battle, feeling sorry for ourselves. It's not meant to be like that. Ephesians chapter 1, because of everything Jesus has done. Listen to this. Uh, I don't want to read the whole lot. In him, I'll pick a good place to read. Um, it, from verse 11. In him also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. But have a look at verse, let's go back to verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. That is, That belongs to you and it belongs to me. And when you think about your life today and all the things that we, you know, we face in this life today and all the things people go through, are we really expectant do we really believe that we have already been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places? Now that spiritual blessing, this is what it means. Because if we're blessed with a, um, every, what does it say? Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, it means we have access to the heavenly places to obtain those spiritual blessings. And then you can read Ephesians 1 about being redeemed and and forgiveness of sins, and the riches of His grace, and all of these things are our inheritance. And so, to be in the heavenlies means you, all your reinforcements to live a victorious life here on earth, are in the heavenlies. They're not here on earth. You don't have 
carnal weapons, you know that one? I've spoken about it a lot lately in 2 Corinthians 10 or 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10 or 10 verse 5, uh, whatever, you can look it up. I've spoken about it such a lot, but I cannot remember exactly where it is now. Um, the, the weapons of a warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. And so we have reinforcements from the spiritual realm that are, we have access to. We live a life where to be in the heavenlies means we're not so heavenly minded that we aren't thinking about what we have to do here on earth. But we are so heavenly minded that our focus is him. And what would he have us do? And what is, what is the weapon he has for us in a battle? And what has he promised us? And how do we pray? So that's to be in the heavenlies. It's to have your mind set on him. I've got a scripture here. Um, I think it is. Let's go to Philippians 4. And remember I spoke to you about the shield of faith. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the shield of faith in a minute. From a different perspective that is very important. If we want to live this life that is vigorous and devoted to God and an active life. And it doesn't mean you go to gym every day and you can do 500 push-ups. It means you have an active life in Christ where you're hearing from God, where you're declaring the word, where your prayers are getting answered, where you are excited about his, your future and where you know the promises of God. It's not like where you are. Our life in the kingdom is not meant to be lying around on our beds, sighing and groaning and saying, oh God, why did you let this happen? When is this going to change? I don't know what to do. That's not a vigorous act of life. That's not the life of God. So we live these lives that are, you know, if the same spirit who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, he will quicken your mortal body. That's a fantastic promise. That is your, your mortal body, the body you live in, um, is quickened by the power of the spirit. Okay, so, so maybe then you can do 500 push-ups. Give it a try, but don't contact me if you are in pain. So where did I say you must go to Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Listen to this. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, this is being heavenly minded. Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble. And you know noble means worthy, something to take note of. Whatever things are noble and also higher. Whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely. Whatever things are of good report. How difficult is it to just focus on the good report these days? If there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. You and I as believers, if you joined in later and you missed that little thing that I read from an Instagram post, please at the end of this message, go to the beginning. If we do this with the help of the Spirit, because you cannot do it in the flesh, with the help of the Spirit, we meditate on these things, we think on these things, then the God of peace is with us. What a promise, the God of peace. Okay, I don't really want to talk to you about peace today because I want to do that in a bite-sized video. But let's see, I might just get there. So, the shield of faith. If we remember, I said Ephesians chapter 6 says, Above all, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. That scripture tells me there's one way to deal with the fiery darts, and that's the shield of faith. But it's not enough just to get up in the morning and say, Here's my shield of faith. You actually have to activate the shield of faith. I'm going to tell you now, but the first thing is, if it says there are fiery darts that have to be quenched, then it means there are fiery darts. Then it means the enemy is out there shooting darts with fire on them, burning darts, trying, shooting at you, trying to get through your shield of faith. Listen, Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 5. 
1 Peter chapter 5. I've got quite a few scriptures today because I felt it was important to give you lots of word. 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 8. You know what I do? Um, when I'm needing some, I need some reinforcement. <laughs> you, know, you know the feeling. When you feel that you're in a bit of a slump, you feel like in the natural you can go and have a vitamin B injection. And suddenly you have this energy for a good couple of weeks. When you read the word and you're in a slump, this word does the same thing. So if you want to live an active, a life that is active, vigorous, and devoted to God, the word of God has to be what you feed yourself on. But in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion. He's not a roaring lion, he's like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith. How do we resist him? With the shield of faith, because it says steadfast in the faith. So, if the devil is out there, like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, and Ephesians 6 tells us that the enemy, the shield of faith, quenches the fiery darts of the wicked one, we know that just because we got saved doesn't mean life is perfect. It means we've now entered a war. But if we are going to live a life in Christ that is victorious because we are overcomers in him, and we have access to all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places, then we know that we are not going to be taken out. Now the shield of faith, you firstly, if you want to quench the fiery darts with the shield of faith, you have to be able to identify what the fiery darts are. So I'm going to give you a little bit of help with this. Of course they're going to be lies about your identity, about your purpose in life, about the promises that you have, about what the Word says, about who God says, who God is to you. And so the fiery darts are all these lies, opposition, resistance, accusations, people gossiping about you. Do you know that? Because you and I as believers have the, the, the power of life and death in our tongues, when we say things about other people and they're not there, and we actually are releasing things over their lives, which is why it's so important to be speaking blessing about people, even your enemies. <laughs> we speak blessing over people who gossip about us, and blessing over people who disagree with us, and you know, and because you can feel oppressed in your life and not know where this is coming from. It could be, it's not always the case, it could be that somebody with authority, the power of life and death in their tongue, is saying things about you that are not in line with God's purpose for your life or God's blessing over your life. And if we just live in this place where we think, oh, I'm just depressed because I feel tired, you know, I'm just, I don't know, I just need to take a break. And we don't get that shield of faith out and identify that the fiery darts are coming because people are releasing things in the unseen realm, in the realm of the Spirit. They're speaking words. You know that um, children's things, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never harm me. It is so wrong. <laughs> it's words in the realm of the Spirit. That's why when we live in the kingdom, our life in, in the Son, our life in Christ, we have access because we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly place. And we go to that place when we say, God, what do I need? I don't know what's going on in my life. I need something here. I need you to speak to me. I need you to show me something. And sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes you have to get into the word and use the word as your weapon to get out of that oppression that brings the shield of faith up. And there's words that are coming your way, just get 
You know, when, when a, a fiery dart hits water, that's exactly what happens. So many times I believe that we are walking around and the enemy is sending all kinds of things our way, using people, using circumstances, using our belief system. These darts are coming our way and they're getting quenched by the shield of faith because our faith is in God and we, we're speaking the word and we are praying and we're being vigilant, we're being sober, we're being alert because we are aware of the enemy and we, we don't even know the assignments of the enemy that are being quenched all the time. But we cannot live with an expectation or with our defense, always on the defense. Oh, the enemy is attacking me. No. I said to you, you have to identify the fiery dot. So maybe it's people speaking about you. I don't know. Maybe it's just because you didn't eat enough carbs for breakfast in the morning and you've got a foggy brain and you think you're under attack. Sometimes we over-spiritualize these things. Do you know that? The other thing is, we need to change the expectation that we have in who our faith is, in God. Here's an example. An, an example. Maybe you've had a bad experience before with something and things didn't work out and you really got hurt and it took you a long time to recover. Let me, let me use an example. Maybe you got invited to preach somewhere and you went and you preached and you came under such attack when you were finished preaching that you said, I never want to do this again. I'm not talking about physical people attacking you. I'm talking about in this realm of the spirit. You felt this heaviness, you felt oppressed, you were tired, you didn't, and you said, I'm never going to do that again. Then you get another invitation to go and preach. And your expectation is already, because it happened before, it's going to happen again. We need to change our expectation, because the shield of faith works when our faith is in God, not in faith in what the enemy is going to do. Because you know we can when our expectation is always on the enemy is going to do this, then the shield of faith is inactive because our faith is in, not in God. It's in what we expect to be happening. I hope you understand what I mean by that. So, previous experience sets us up for what we expect now. So, um, I had a chat to somebody um, the other day about a certain medication they were on and I'm hoping she's going to be listening today if she hasn't joined in now maybe another she'll catch up a certain medication she was on that caused her to be depressed and it was a really tough thing that she went through but because she's been diagnosed with something she's been prescribed the same medication that caused depression now she says she has to stand against the depression, which is right. But sometimes the devil gets her eyes so much on what happened before that we don't put our faith in God, we get ourselves in defensive mode. I can't get depressed, I can't get depressed. Instead of saying, God, I'm going to meditate on the Philippians 4, 8 to 9 things so that the God of peace is with me and the peace we have activates that shield of faith. We used to know people in ministry who, here's another example, and I'm talking to you about identifying the fiery dots, because that shield of faith has to be active all the time. And unless you know how the enemy is going to attack you, you're aware of the weak spots in your life, the blind spots, the things that make you feel down, the things people say to you that set you on a downward spiral, because you've heard this all your life. And you, you don't know what to do about it. So we get our eyes off these things and we get our eyes on God and that activates the shield of faith. So we're no longer living. We're aware, we're, we're awake, the 1 Peter 5. We're aware of the devil who's like a roaring lion seeking you may, you, whom he may devour. But now we've identified those areas that he sends the fiery darts that way. Maybe you've been in a church before where the leadership were controlling and... Um, here, I'll give you this story first, and then I'll get into the, the other one I want to give you. Um, we were in a church where the leadership became very controlling, and um, they it was quite bad. 
It was quite, that's all I have to say. Very controlling. Um, and then a lot of people left. And a lot of those people who left the church because of what happened were too scared to go to another church because they expected the same behavior from the leadership wherever they went. So that caused an area in their lives where they didn't have faith in God to protect them from leadership in churches. They were so focused on, I can't trust anybody because this happened before. So as I said, previous experience will set you up. If we don't deal with previous experience and the hurts we've had, those fiery darts just get through the shield of faith. So the other thing um, is, I was saying, we knew people in ministry before who um, they would go and do things in ministry and they would go on mission trips and they'd preach at conferences and they'd do all fantastic things. Now remember I'm talking to you about life in the sun and it looks like this is going to have to be a two-part thing because they haven't even got to the good news yet. So um, they would go and do all kinds of things, but then... They had this, they would come back with these great reports about what God had done, amazing things. But then they would say, be, they wouldn't say it in these words, but this was the expectation. Because God has used us this way, there's going to be backlash from the enemy. Backlash. Um, and so they would have to do extra prayer over their families and their kids and their finance and all kinds of things. And more than likely, something would happen somewhere down the line. An attack from the enemy came. And they felt that this was right. This was normal because they had gone out and done something for God. That is not God, life in the sun. Now we read the stories in the, in the New Testament about how the disciples were martyred. And Paul was, you know, uh, people were stoned and put in prison, and beaten, and all kinds of things. They were, they were pioneering the beginning of the church age. Now, we know people today are still imprisoned, and things still happen. But we cannot live this life in, the, in Christ. We cannot live this life in Christ thinking that every time God tells us to do something, the enemy is going to send something our way because... Um, because of what we did for God. There's a scripture in my Bible that tells me, No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Every tongue that rises up against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. I think it's Isaiah 59. Is it? Somebody put the scripture up there. So we need to know that when God gives us something to do, we go out there with a shield of faith activated. We go out there with the purpose of God in our lives. We have angelic protection. We have the Spirit of God who's leading us, protecting us, praying through us. And we have everything, uh, the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. That includes your purpose in God, what you're going to do for God. So we cannot be believers who live with the fear Every, Isaiah 54, 17, thank you, Renee. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Every time we put our toe in the water and we do something for God, then the devil's going to send a tidal wave our way. No. No, we cannot believe that. So, so whenever, you know, anyway, we have to identify these fiery dots. If you're a believer who thinks every time God's going to tell me to plant a church, preach a message, then I need to expect, it's like, I need to run away and hide in my cave and put my head under the blankets until the storm has passed. No, we go in the anointing. There's an anointing and a grace for you and I to live out our purpose here in the earth, whether you go to work, whether you're a housewife, a teacher, a preacher, whatever you are, you have an anointing. You've been set apart to live a life that is victorious and overcoming. Okay? So, we guard against that That thinking we have to guard ourselves against that kind of thinking that there's backlash from the enemy no there's protection from god because he said go and do it it's a different thing if you go and do your own thing then you're going to come under the you're going to be right there in the firing line because god his grace is with you to do what he's called you to do okay 
remember that. Have a look at, um, I think this is in Acts chapter 3. Here's another expectation that we have to be aware of. Acts chapter 3. And I'm going to finish soon, and then what I'll do is I'll, I'll do this in, in two, two different parts. Acts chapter 3 is when Peter and John go up to the temple. At the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gates of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked for alms, he asked for money, a donation. Now remember this guy, later on you'll find out he was 40, after we got healed. I think this is the guy who was 40 years old. So for for probably 25 to 30 years, he had been carried daily, put outside the gates leading to the temple where he would beg for money. So that was his expectation. Until Peter and John came along and he still asked them for money. I think he would have known who these guys were by now. Because every every time they went to pray at the temple, it was the hour of prayer, they would probably pass the same guy sitting there. And it says he sat there every day. I don't know in your neighborhood if you've got the same people who stand at the same traffic lights every day with the same board. If you're not in South Africa, you might not have seen this. The same board that says, I need a job willing to work, uh, bless you, kids with empty stomachs kind of thing. They say this. The same people every day. Now it's like whenever we drive to the mall, it's like, hello, how are you? We don't give them money, but they know who we are. They probably know where we live. And so this is the same guy who sat in the same place every day. His expectation would have been money. Just give me money so I can survive. Until one day, Peter and John came along and and Peter, fixing his eyes on him, said, Look at us. Silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Now sometimes you and I, and if this shoe fits, please wear it and then get up so you can be strengthened. Sometimes you and I are like this man sitting at the gate. All we expect is God to just give us a little tip. Just give us one word. Just give us something so we can survive, so we can get to the end of the day. Because we don't realize that this is not normal life in the kingdom. Normal life in the kingdom, remember, is... Zoe life, a life active and vigorous, devoted to God. The world out there does not know this kind of life. So they have an expectation and it will come out of their mouths. Life is hard. People are struggling. Yes, life is hard and people are struggling. But in the kingdom, we have a different expectation. So we're not sitting saying, God, just give me enough to get by. We're saying, God. I want the God kind of life. I want what Peter and John gave to this guy. Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. And that was the resurrection life of Christ, the inheritance that we have. Now, I'm not saying you have to find every beggar sitting on the street and go raise them up to get healed. I'm talking about your life first. Is your expectation just that I just have to get by? Because that's not God's plan for your life. His plans, it says in the Old Testament in Jeremiah 29, are to give you a future and a hope. His life for you is a life of abundance and increase and peace, remember? And if you joined in later, I gave you Philippians 4, 8 to 9. The God of peace will be with us. 1 Peter 5 verse 8. So when we begin to, this, this one is a big fiery dart. But it gets quenched so quickly by the shield of faith when we say, God, I refuse to live a life of just getting by. I refuse to live a life where every day is stress and arguments and sickness and lack and all of these things that do not belong in the life 
of a person in the kingdom of God who has an inheritance in Christ, I, Lord, my faith is in you that I can break through into that life. And the, the, the fiery darts get quenched. That's a huge dart. Your expectation of what does God have for you in this season, in this life that you have. And it's not just give me some, give me a donation, you know, give me some money. So that's a big fiery dart. I've got another nice one, but I'm going to save it for Thursday, I think. So I've got a scripture here, 1 John 5 verse 4, and I don't think I read that to you. Are you learning something here today? Are you being encouraged? 1 John 5 verse 4 says this, Oh, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. We have to overcome the world. <laughs> It's not we're gonna, what are we going to do today? We're going to take over the world. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the barrage of fear and insecurity and challenging the, per the promises of God, challenging the purpose of God in your life, all of that stuff. It's our faith that overcomes that. And it's not faith, the doing of faith. It's believing it's activating that shield of faith and saying, and I see what the fiery darts are. I see that I've been fearful about I've been fearful about my future. Maybe that's your fiery dart. I can't see any future for myself or my family. The business is just going downhill. I don't know what to do. That's a fiery dart coming your way. And the way you you, you deal with that fiery dart is activate the shield of faith by saying, God, what are you saying to me about this thing I've been fearing? And just believing it's normal to fear because of the, the environment that we live in. It's not normal for a believer to fear. There's days where we feel anxious about things. It's not normal. There's a, there's a, a supplement in the scripture for everything that get, brings anxiety our way. There's things that happen in families. There's abuse. There's all kinds of stuff going on. It's not normal. So we have to get that shield of faith out and say, God, I have a life promised to me in Christ. I'll read Ephesians to you again. I'm going to end with that. And then the rest I'll give to you on Thursday. We have a life promised in Christ that is so powerful that even when the circumstances don't line up with what God has promised, we, the God of peace is still with us. Even when we're still trusting for healing and breakthrough and provision and a new job, the God of peace is with us because our shield of faith is up there and we're not going to let those fiery darts take us out. So blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. I read, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all abound. Not just a little tip. In all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he pur purposed in himself. And then it says here, if you're still there, um, the, the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. We talk about the heavenly places here again. Look at Ephesians 2. And you he made alive. Talks about the life of God who were dead in trespasses and sins. The world out there does not know the life that we know. They do not have access to what we know, the spiritual inheritance we have, the power that we have, the armor of God, the shield of faith. It's so powerful. And they do not know this stuff because they don't know Christ. So you and I, living in the kingdom as believers, identify those fiery darts. Say, God, what is it? What is it? Okay, I'll give you a little bit of a story. One of the ways that we overcome this being in a slump, feeling down, is we get someone to pray with us and for us. Um, 
and I'll, I'll have to repeat this on Thursday because I really feel this is important. Um, when you feel, you feel oppressed, you feel this heaviness, you can't break through, you feel as if God's not speaking. Don't begin to think it's normal because that's the biggest trap. That's a fiery dart. You think it's normal, you think one day I'll feel better. No. Find somebody who will pray with you and for you, and you'll see what happens. Now, I do this often when I'm feeling like that, and I know I'm not, there's no reason I should be feeling heavy or you know, that kind of thing. So fortunately, I have Rory, and I say, Rory, this is how I'm feeling, and he'll say, okay, I'm going to pray for you, and he'll pray for me, and that thing will go. And the reason is, when you tell somebody else how you're feeling, and they listen to you, and they have an open ear to hear what the Spirit is saying, they see something from a different perspective as you, the one feeling the heaviness. They will say, but why do you feel like that? Maybe it could be this. Maybe someone says something about you. Da, da, da. I'll give you all the maybes. And it begins to open your understanding a bit as to why you could be feeling heavy. And then you realize that you thought you were tolerating it because you thought it was normal. That happens to me often. I just have, I feel as if I've lost my joy for no reason at all. And then I just carry on with life. And then, um, you know, days go by and I think, I think this is normal. Um, you know, I, I can't see it. There's nothing wrong. I'm still reading my Bible. But I feel heavy for no reason. I, uh, you know, I try and work up my joy and nothing happens. And then I think, maybe it's hormonal. You know? <laughs> and then I think, this is nonsense. And I go to Rory and I say, Rory, this is how I'm feeling. And he'll pray for me and straight away that heaviness lifts. I can see again. I can see the sunshine again and this dark cloud is gone. It's because I've gone to somebody I trust. And I've stopped believing. The fiery dart is not how I was feeling. It's that I believed that it was normal. When people are sick, I'll give you this and then we'll end. When it comes to physical things, when people are sick, there's something that comes along with it. And there's this heaviness and this... Can you imagine people in the world who are battling with sickness and they have no one to turn to you? Um, and so when there's, a, when there's sickness involved, then there's a heaviness that comes along with it. You don't want to feel sick. You feel terrible. You can't go out and see people. Maybe you're in pain and you, you trust in God for healing, but there's this heaviness that comes along with it. Then you find somebody to agree with you for what God promised instead of what you're feeling and seeing, and that heaviness lifts. And then you might not get your healing straight away, but you begin to get a different perspective. And that's the perspective of God. Sometimes when people are sick, I'm talking about Christians, they accept it as this is normal. I'm meant to feel this way because this is what the doctor said, or this is what Google said. That's even worse. And then people live their lives with this heaviness and this oppression because of something that's been diagnosed instead of saying, no, God, what is the word? And finding somebody who will pray for them, that that thing will lift. And then you go to God and you, you get the answers where before the heaviness was so, the oppression was so thick that you read the word. And it's almost like, I don't know what I'm reading here. Until you find somebody who can agree with you and that thing lifts. That's a fiery dark. Believing, you will begin to see what you actually tolerate that is not meant to be tolerated all of us there's something in our lives that we just put up with it's like putting up with bad behavior of you, from your kids now i don't have that because my kids have moved out of the house <laughs> but putting up with bad behavior and nobody disciplines them nobody tells them it's wrong they just accept people the family just accepts this is normal because they're teenagers or toddlers or what let's leave toddlers alone teenagers they just believe this is normal so they live in this environment of oh, this bad behavior is normal so this arguing and fighting it's normal 
It's not, there are things in the kingdom that are not normal because they don't fit into our inheritance. That's why I read Isaiah 53. Poverty, sickness, um, oppression, uh, condemnation, all of these things. It's not normal to tolerate these things because a price was paid for them. So, that's my encouragement for you today. I'll come back with part two on Thursday morning and I'll give you all the good news on Tuesday morning. I see Sharon Wingfield is here and you sent 50 stars. That is amazing. I see this new thing that Facebook has come up with that um, you can send a comment with stars. So, I think, Sharon, I think you deserve a prize because I think you might be the first person to send me some stars. I don't know. I don't know what it really means, but thank you for those 50 stars. Yeah, it's true. Not looking at the feeling. And we just, we train to live by how we feel. Even when it comes to the anointing, we think, if I don't have goosebumps, if I don't start shaking, I don't have an anointing. Our shield of faith needs to be activated. Deirdre van der Volt, I see you've joined in. Just as we are leaving, unless you've been here before. Helen Muskides, welcome to you. Suzanne Nielsen, welcome to you. Amanda de Vries, Fontini Wilters, I have got some fantastic news for you. We're going to be in Joburg sometime this year. But I'll wait for you to find out another way. That's all I can say right now. I'm not giving you dates or where we're going to be. Um, Lisa, thank you for being here from Canada. Renee Ibe, thank you for your help there with that scripture. David Means Pandu is here. Joe Laidlaw, you're back again. Um, okay, uh, Eleanor Anne Marie Gallant, welcome to you. Uh, Marianne Anderson, so nice to see you on my uh, live session. Michelle Doralingo, good to see you. Penny Dunn, Ilza Gopal, Ingrid Willis, Renee Iba, I've said hello to some of you already. So I don't want to repeat myself. Maria Boven was here. Thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. And I trust you were enabled to go and identify the fiery dots so that you don't put up with rubbish. Live a life that is the God kind of life. The Active, vigorously active, and devoted to God. That's the kind of life. 1 John 5, verse 919. I'm really not doing well with my scriptures today. I closed my Bible. So it's in here if you need the scriptures. 1 John 5, somewhere. We are called this life. I'll actually post it up now. We, this life that we live, um, the evidence is that we have eternal life, and this life is in His Son, in Jesus. I love the Easter weekend when we, we get reminded of the price Jesus paid, and then Resurrection Day comes. We live on the other side of the cross. We thank, we're thankful for the, the price Jesus paid, the powerful inheritance we have, and we live in resurrection life. So don't put up with the rubbish. If you feel heavy, phone someone, get them to pray with you, um, and, and live a life that's expectant to see the hand of God. That's what it's all about. We are set apart to live a victorious life in Christ. So thank you for joining me. Have a fantastic rest of your Tuesday afternoon, and I will see you on Thursday morning. I'm very soon, I'm going to get back into my usual times again. I just took some time off. We were quite busy um, and I'm going to do my best to get back into my regular times again from Thursday. But then again, I'll, I'll let you know. Thursday will be 9.30 in the morning, but I will post up again beforehand. I love you all. Thank you so much for joining, and I'll see you soon. Bye. Thanks for joining today's session. I hope you were equipped, empowered, and encouraged today by what you heard. Remember, you can find all the live video sessions that you may have missed on this page, on the Facebook page, Kathy Mole Ministries, or on YouTube, Kathy Mole on YouTube. You can also find all the other resources on kathymole.com.